Okay, so um, this section is about, so their construction uses dualizable patterns, but all the other constructions that we've seen in the past that are kind of trying to attack this um, blue Kirby question or various other related questions often use annulus twisting methods. Uh, so this section is them kind of saying, well, actually the constructions that we are making are secretly kind of annulus twists. Um, and kind of how that relates to some of the other questions that uh, come up relating to this Akalu Kirby conjecture. So we already talked about uh, annulus presentations, but I'll just remind you. So um, so we have an annulus, an S3, and it could be, so I think, Lisa and Allison use a more specific definition, but for us it was uh, an annulus that could be knotted in any way or twisted is fine. Um, and then we have a band that we're gonna glue on. So that's just a rectangle that we're embedding in S3 in a particular way. Um, so let me just draw it. So I'm going to emphasize that two of the sides are smaller. That's where the gluing is going to happen. And then I have two long sides that don't get glued. And uh, we have some conditions. So if the following are satisfied, so first, um, how does the band get glued on? So it just gets glued along these short edges um, and the band only meets um, A along its boundary, uh, except for some rib ribbon singularities. So B intersects, oops. The interior of A, so just write A interior in ribbon singularities. And we can take the union of this band and the annulus to get a surface. Um, it's not embedded, right? Because it has some singularities, but it's an immersed surface. Uh, and we want it to be orientable. So we should check that. Um, surface F. And finally, if the boundary of F, so this is a little weird to say since it's immersed, but I mean, it, it's the same definition of what we mean by boundary, um, sits in S3 and is a knot. So it's, it could be a link, um, but we're not considering that case. So we should check that it's actually a knot. Okay, so uh, that's what we mean by K having an annulus presentation. Okay. Uh, okay, I have some pre-drawn pictures. So here's an example. So ignoring the green and red curves for now. Um, so the blue was just a unknotted annulus. And then we took the squiggly band. It crashes through the surface of the annulus a couple, uh, maybe just once and kind of twists around. Um, and then you can check if you want that the boundary of this is actually a knot. Um, so let's just remember um, what these these curves are telling us is the reason that annulus presentations are nice is that they allow us to do an operate or operation called annulus twisting. So let me just remind you, we also talked about this. So an annulus twist was the operation um, of doing uh, one over N and minus one over n surgery on the two push-offs into the interior of the surface of uh, the boundary of this annulus. And there's some convention about which curve gets which coefficient, but 
it's not so important for us, so we won't go into that. Uh, okay, so here is one of our examples from before. So, um, right, so the square thing is kind of the annulus. So in a lot of their pictures, they draw the annulus part as square so you can see where it is. Um, this one has a twist, that's fine. Um, and then some band crashing through. And this happens to be the knot 820. Uh, but if we do an annulus twist to it along these red and blue curves, uh, depending on uh, some convention of sign, um, where this band crashes through, so the only thing that gets affected by an annulus twist are things that crash through the annulus, and this is the only place where that happens. So basically what happens is that you cut this band, um, and the band that you cut kind of follows around the surface of the annulus once and then con connects back up where you cut it. So that's what's happening here. Whoops. And then a lot of times we do, uh, we change any twists that are happening in this annulus to surgery picture because it's easier for us to draw it at this, at this point because once this curve has to go around through, um, through the twisted region, it gets kind of messy. So that's what this minus one surgery on this unlinked, unknotted component is telling us. Sorry, hand for what's happening. Okay. Uh, here's another example. So this is closer to the things that um, Allison and Lisa are drawing. So for them, um, an annulus presentation always looks like this. So the annulus is unknotted, it has one twist, one positive twist in it, and these black regions are telling you where to attach the band. Um, and uh, this curve alpha is not part of the description of being an, uh, an annulus presentation, but it will be important later. So we're just going to see what happens to it under doing one annulus twist. And again, I'm not being careful about whether I'm doing a um, positive or a negative annulus twist, and they also aren't careful about it in the paper. They kind of just say, well, either plus or minus work. So there, anyway, there's, we're making some choice here, but it doesn't really matter which one we're doing. So either we did a positive annulus twist here or a negative annulus twist. And so this beta is supposed to be what happens to alpha under this twisting operation. And then I just redrew it here to look more like their picture. Okay. So that'll be important later, but that, that's just showing that um, kind of their more specific definition of what an annulus knot is. So when they say, so K was the knot that we started with, we're not specifying what the band is doing. Uh, it could be literally anything. And then KT0 means K, I did either a plus or minus one annulus twist on K. Okay. And then why do we care about annulus twisting is that uh, we know that it preserves the zero surgery, right? So if K admits an annulus presentation. We showed a long time ago um, that for any integer, there's some corresponding annulus twist. So there's a knot kt obtained from annulus twisting k um, with the same zero surgery. Uh, and in fact, I don't think we showed this, and I actually don't know how hard this is to show, um, that this extends to uh, diffeomorphism of knot traces. Okay. Are there any questions before I start talking about patterns again.
Right. So, um, so all the results we talked about before are actually coming from dualizable patterns and um, what they're going to kind of try to show is some relationship between annulus presentations and dualizable patterns. And I think the direction is that given an annulus presentation, they're going to give, um, they're going to come up with a dualizable pattern. Okay. So, oops. Ah! So what they show is that given a knot um, with an annulus presentation, and um, KT0 be the knot obtained from annulus twisting, doing one plus or minus um, annulus twist on K, then there's some dualizable pattern P um, with of the unknot being r not kt0 and its dual is k. Its dual on the unknot is k. Okay, so we're going to try to prove this first through uh, several claims, but first we're going to even try to see how we should think of our knot kt0 as a pattern because we don't really have a natural solid torus necessarily to consider. Um, so the one they consider, right, so here's our knot, this is kt0. So this is after we did an annulus twist and beta is what happened to alpha after the twist. Um, so one natural option um, is to um, remove the neighborhood of beta. So I'm just going to redraw it a little differently. So here's beta. All I've really done to get to this picture is I can think of sending uh, a point of beta to through the point at infinity so I can make it look like a straight up and down arc. So that's what this picture is, just so it's more clear kind of what the pattern would look like. Um, so Right, so if I drew beta in this way and I remove beta, then the whole of the torus would be somewhere here, and the pattern is happening somewhere inside of this torus. So this is the pattern that they're talking about. Right, so given a knot, we have many choices for how we stick it inside of a solid torus, and this is the one that they've chosen. So when we say P, we mean, um, so here, K is sitting inside the solid torus, uh, call it B. Um, uh, that's what they mean by P. Okay, so, okay, at least we have a pattern. Um, and now the reason they chose this one is that at least this one is dualizable. So that's what we're going to try to show. So first, oops. So, uh -oh. sorry, this is my first time using this program. I don't know. Uh, 
Okay. So remember, we said also pretty long time ago that a pattern, um, one definition of being dualizable is um, something about how it sits inside of S1 cross S2. So, if, um, right, so there's a natural embedding of the pattern inside of S1 cross S2. So, if in that picture, the pattern can be isotoped to S1 cross a point. Um, then it's dualizable. So we're not going to have such a nice picture, but um, note that if I do, since beta is unknotted, if I do zero surgery on it, I get S1 cross S2. So I'm going to think of beta now as having a zero framing. And so an equivalent statement is that um, this pattern, so P is dualizable um, if and only if um, I can slide. So if the link KT0 my not uh, union this unknotted beta um, can be made isotopic to the hop link by sliding kt0 over um, a zero frame beta uh, finitely many times. So let's see, put a picture down here. So what they mean by um, that uh, I can isotop it to the hop link just means that I can draw kt0 as a meridian of beta, basically. Because they're both unknots, so if they're linked like this, they'll be isotopic to the hop link. And this sliding over the zero frame beta is like equivalent to this picture that we had of S1 cross S2 where we were taking arcs and like swinging them around this sphere. So that's kind of the picture. So um, actually, so one slide over beta is actually enough. So here's an example. So this is a little um, deceptive. So here's the knot that, um, that we looked at before. Um, so remember that, oh, I guess we didn't say this, but maybe you can see from the picture. So the blue is beta. And the claim is that um, beta and um, I'm looking at this part of the picture here. So I'm claiming that actually this part of KT0 and this blue beta are not linked. So I could redraw this picture like this where beta is sitting inside and um, beta is zero frame. So it makes sense to slide over it. Even, even if there's stuff crashing through this picture, that's OK. So that's what's kind of deceptive about this picture. So in, in different annulus presentations, there might even be more curves crashing through here. So um, I think one of their pictures kind of illustrates like the worst possible situation. But even if there are things crashing through here, we're allowed to slide this black arc off of um, this zero frame beta to get this picture here, which I've tried to draw down here. So it slides past all of these curves. And this is great because um, this was the band. So basically, it's all just going to unravel. So I'll try to illustrate that in this example. Right. So
Um, and because this was obtained from annulus twisting, once I kind of undo the band, um, it all just kind of slides through and falls apart. Okay, and here we have um, that beta is a meridian of K, which is what it means to be um, isotopic to the Hopf link. Um, uh, and so uh, this was just an example, proof by example, but uh, anytime you have an annulus presentation, you can do this slide and kind of unravel the whole knot. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we know there is a dual. Um, and it's much harder to see, I think, from this picture what it would look like. So there's a dual P star. Uh, what is it? Well, we're hoping it's K, right? That's what we said before. Um, okay, so now we want to think of, just like for KT0, there are many different patterns we could choose that have the property that the pattern on the unknot is KT0. Now we want to define um, some pattern for K as a candidate to be a dual for, um, for P. So PK is going to be, um, let's see. So let me say, so we're going to let B prime S3 minus a neighborhood of alpha. So I'm not very good at using this program, but let me go back, 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 back. Okay, so this was K, right? And so alpha was this blue curve, which um, was the thing that mapped to beta under the annulus twist. So that's what I mean by alpha. So if I remove alpha from S3, alpha is also unknotted, so uh, I get a solid torus. Um, so in that case, ooh, no. Um, then uh, the pattern PK is defined by um, how uh, k sits inside of e prime. Okay, so that's what we mean by p sub k. And now uh, another claim is that p star is um, the same pattern as p sub k. So that's that's the dual of p. Okay, so. We're going to look at a series of, this is maybe the audience participation part of this talk, just in case this doesn't make sense. Um, so because I have an argument, but I'm not sure if I believe it. So please jump in. OK, so. Um, in, uh, let me go back to this picture. I'm sorry, because it takes me a long time to get there. But um, first we were thinking of, right. So in their picture, they really were thinking of these as zero frames, um, K and K sub T zero. 
oh, I probably should have said this before. I wasn't very careful about this. Um, technically, I think alpha and beta live in the zero surgeries of K and K sub T not. And so when I write beta here, I should really call it beta prime because this is an S3. But the picture is still the same. This K sub T zero is just not zero frame. We're not doing surgery. So alpha and beta really live in the zero surgery of K and K sub T zero. Okay, so at least makes sense to remove the neighborhood of these two. So these are definitely the same um, because annulus twisting doesn't uh, change the zero surgeries and um, this alpha gets sent to beta under the annulus twist. So um, this is just a fact of annulus twisting. Uh, okay, this one is the one that um, I'm not so clear on. So the claim is that if I remove a neighborhood of alpha from the zero surgery of K, then I get the complement of K. And I think, so uh, I won't draw the whole picture, but alpha was a meridian of K. So maybe... Um, it's correct to say that. Um, so where does a meridian of K go under surgery? It goes to the longitude. So a meridian of K under surgery, under zero surgery goes to a longitude of K. So um, basically in the zero surgery, alpha is, I guess, isotopic to the surgery core. People buy that? Okay. So um, now we want to futz around with this part of the equation. So look at the zero surgery of K sub T zero. And I'm going to remove a neighborhood of beta, which is the same as the solid torus minus a pattern. Okay, so uh, this is homeomorphic. So remember, V was what happened when we removed um, when we removed a neighborhood of beta, technically beta prime, because this was an S three. So we got a solid torus in S three. Um, but we technically want to be in a zero surgery, so we should do zero surgery, so uh, zero framed. Oh, no, I guess that's what lambda p is saying, right? So to get back to zero surgery, right, we have to do zero surgery on k, which is the same as doing zero surgery on the pattern that gives us k, um, and doing it along lambda p just means doing zero surgery. Okay, so we're just rewriting what these spaces another way to say what these spaces are. Okay, and then by definition, um, since P is dualizable, we showed that, uh, we know that there's some um, an orientation preserving homeomorphism. Um, from a complement of the pattern in the solid torus to the complement of the dual uh, in a different solid torus. Right? And what happens 
and we know what happens to all the curves, but for us, we just want to know what happens to lambda p. Um, it goes to lambda v star. Okay, so finally, um, that means that we can think of this as um, so s zero surgery on case of T zero minus neighborhood of beta is actually isomorphic to um, this pattern complement, Dane filled, Dane filled along uh, lambda V star. And the claim is that this is the complement of P star of U. So let's look at a picture. Um, so V star is some, oops, some solid torus. So this is P star. I don't know, has several curves going around. And um, what does it mean to fill along lambda sub v star, uh, that's, I'll try to draw it uh, in a way that's not intersecting with the rest of the picture. That's this curve here. So we've taken a solid torus and um, we're asking now that, um, that this curve bounds a disk. Um, so that means that we're getting S3 back, right? Because in the, this is like the standard decomposition of S3 where uh, we removed this complementary torus, but now we're asking that this, um, this curve bounds a disk. So, uh, so we get S3 back, but remember we're still missing the pattern. So, um, so it's S3 minus the, um, minus the neighborhood of the pattern. Okay, so finally, um, Black. Uh, S3 minus the neighborhood of the pattern of U is, let's go back. So we said that uh, this manifold was homeomorphic to the complement of K. Great. And um, apparently this is maybe an over, like a hammer uh, that's not necessarily necessary, but we can use the gordon lukey theorem to tell us that these are the same knots. So K is isotopic to P star of U. Sorry. Okay. So what did we show? We showed that um, if I have an annulus knot, um, then there's some way that I can put it in a solid torus that, um, so that its pattern is dualizable and that the dual uh, is, um, is an annual, either a plus or minus one annulus twist on K. Okay. So, um, now we want to show that these knots that we've been talking about in this paper the whole time, these very specific um, dualizable patterns have an annulus presentation. So here's a picture of them. Um, I don't know how similar this looks to other pictures that we were looking at, but this is how they drew it in the section. So from this picture, it's still not really clear to me that that this has an annulus presentation. So, um, zoom out a little bit. Okay, so this is the case where n is equal to minus one. So there's no twisting down here. Um, so, let's see. Right, so here's the, the twisting part is here. So here's one place where the band is meeting and uh, let's see, where's the other? 
maybe here. Uh oh. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. Maybe that's the best way to try. Oh no. Mm -hmm. through here. And Okay, uh, this is also audience participation part. Right, so does the, does the picture I drew not make any sense? Or is it obvious to anyone why, let's say there's no twists here, where is the annulus in the picture? So, I mean, the way that I've drawn it, this should be this. Okay, sorry. So yeah, so here's, yes, okay. So here's my annulus. I think here's one boundary component and here is, oops, yes, here is the other. And then the band, is over here. Okay. Slightly happy. Okay, and then if there are more twists, um, just to convince you of what's going on down here, um, if Let's say, um, I'm just looking at what's happening uh, in this region. So that was if there were zero twists. But if there are more twists, we can redraw it like uh, this, right? So kind of draw it as a braid. So instead of them all twisting together, I'm first doing n plus one twists on just the two of them that are part of the band. And then this other curve is just wrapping around the whole thing and plus one time. So that's equivalent. And I've kind of drawn it so that you can see that, you know, this part is going to be part of the annulus. And so each twist gives another region where the band is crashing through the, the annulus disc. Okay. So hopefully the picture made it somewhat clear that you could argue that, um, that all of these knots have annulus presentation. Uh, okay, so now what, what I want to point out about what that implies is, okay, so let's recall that, um, no. So our patterns were tau n sub j and um, and we applied them to the unknot and we compared that to what happens if we do the dual. Um, and we showed, okay, not only are they not the same, um, but they're not concordant, right? So they had different D invariants. And so they're not smoothly concordant. Um, okay, and so they felt that they wanted to point out that um, this gives 
infinitely many examples. With um, K having an annulus presentation. And K prime, as usual, is obtained by a plus or minus one annulus twist. Um, but K and K prime are not uh, smoothly accordant. Um, so this is, I don't, I don't think this was a conjecture ever, but maybe it's kind of surprising. Um, so I guess kind of implicit in all of these um, conjectures, since a lot of these constructions come from annulus twisting, is that you, you could never get um, not concordant uh, knots by annulus twisting. Um, and I guess, um, for these reasons, so uh, first of all, if uh, K and K prime are related by annulus twisting, um, then if K is slice, K prime is slice. Um, so I think that kind of informed a lot of like intuition on on how annulus twisting works. And I mean, they kind of point out in the paper that a lot of these examples um, th that are considered, the knots are often slice, um, start out slice. So um, Lisa and Allison's examples are kind of special in that they are knots related by annulus twisting and they, they're not slice. Um, okay, so, right. And so a lot of these theorems that we've been talking about Uh, build examples um, where, oops, where you get this dichotomy where either k couldn't be concordant to k prime uh, obtained by annulus twisting, sorry, could not be, um, or uh, slice ribbon was false. Um, and they weren't easily, I mean, pr I presume like these knots are just probably not concordant, but they weren't able to show it. So um, I don't know if you can go back and check the D invariance of these knots and see that they're not concordant. But anyway, um, these examples are kind of the first examples in this series of paper where we're able to distinguish them in concordance. Um, okay. Um, so I just want to end with, this is com completely a uh, topic change, so I'll just pause for questions for a second. But after that, we'll talk about um, how their results um, give new actions on the concordance group. So are there any questions about how their knots relate to annual twisting or any of these people? Other way around? What? Then can oh. we go the other way around? So can you find an endless presentation for a pair of knots given by these uh, dualizable patterns? Yeah, I they go from dualizable patterns to annulus, but mm -hmm. the other way around. So we proved that hmm. I mean we kind of we kind of started with assuming that the knot had an annulus presentation and then we got these dualizable patterns but I don't know if I mean that would be like assuming that every dualizable pattern on the unknot has an annulus presentation I don't 
I guess I'd be surprised, but I really don't know which knots admit annulus presentations or how much is known about that. Yeah, huh. I'm just wondering if like the equivalent in some sense. Yeah, I built in one of the other yeah, other I, around. I don't know. Oh. Mm -hmm. I see. So we're just saying that the the knots we're looking at in this paper, these 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 dualized this dualizing sort of uh operation can be related to alias twisting. We're not saying that in general or Right, we're, yeah, we started, well, okay, I mean, they said something a little more general. They said for any knot that admits an annulus presentation, you can come up with some dualizable patterns. And then we showed that for their knots, they, they have a, um, an annulus presentation. I don't know if that's surprising or if, it, like, you'd expect them to have annulus presentation for some reason. Uh, yeah. So if you're a dualizable pattern, and you have an analyst presentation, then finding the dual is sort of the same thing as uh, doing the analyst twist. That's that's kind of yeah. But oh, okay, so it's not for any dualizable pattern. It's like there is a dualizable pattern. So we chose a specific way. Like we had a knot, and then we chose a specific way that it embeds in the torus. So it's not for any pattern representing a knot with an annulus presentation. I see, yeah. Okay, so this is just very quick because um, it's not talked about in detail, um, so let me just remind you that um, the concordance group is the set of knots. Uh, we're talking about smooth concordance. That's an equivalent. Uh, the elements are equivalent classes, uh, and then under connected sum. And I mean, as you all know, we just really don't know that much about this group. And in particular, we don't know what uh, like automorphisms of this group can exist. Um, so here's a fact. So any pattern P gives an action on a concordance group. Um, so what I mean, I have a knot K. Uh, well, I actually have its equivalence class, and I send it to the equivalence class of P of K. And so I think somewhere along the way in the seminar, we showed that this is like well defined. Um, but there's some other things that you might want to be true. So the properties. So, okay, you could ask that it's a homomorphism. So that's already pretty hard, I think. So you have to have, in that case, you must have P of the unknot being slice, at the very least. Um, so that doesn't happen for all patterns, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's more you would have to check for that to be true. Um, okay, you might want it to be what's called invertible, which means it has an inverse. So in that case, you need um, just to have P being dualizable. Okay, great. So we know that dualizable patterns exist, so uh, it's possible to get some invertible actions. Um, and then one thing you might want is, um, I guess it's kind of hard to construct something that's not just um, the action under connected sum. So, um, so there's one obvious action, right? Which is like, uh, I could send 
um, I could pick my favorite knot and send, you know, k to um, the class of k connect sum my, I don't know, favorite knot, k star. So that gives an action on concordance. Um, but it's, I guess it's not very interesting. Um, and so what this paper shows is that I think they call it theorem B. Uh, there are convertible patterns which don't act, I guess let me say it like this, which um, act on concordance um, and are not the connected sum action. So we're not claiming that this is a homomorphism, but it is, it is invertible and it's not the same as, uh, as doing connected sum by some, by some not. Um, and Wait, when you say this paper, uh, which paper are you referring to? Uh, Lisa and Allison's paper. Uh, you good? I don't just don't quite see theorem B, but I, I can look for it later. Oh, oh, I was looking at the journal version. Maybe it's different. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I'm almost done, so we can. We can find it after. But I'm just going to show that if I have a dualizable pattern, um, it's not going to act by connected sum. So, um, sorry, not in general, the one that we're talking about. So, tau, tau sub n of, is that what we called it? Oh man, it's been a while. Of J, right? Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't write it like this. Now I'm of J. Uh, okay, so we're going to claim that this uh, doesn't act by connect sum. Uh, okay, so kind of an auxiliary thing, we're going to notice that um, the on not is concordant to P of P inverse. So uh, by P inverse, we mean uh, the inverse operation, which is just gonna be um, the dual, which I'm gonna write in a second. But um, if um, this would, then this would have to be concordant to Um, this connects them, and um, this is. So there is this weird convention. So the dual is not quite right. We need to do something with the orientation. So that's what this bar is. Um, so okay, the point of uh, this series of equivalences is that if um, if this was the same as the connect sum action, that's where this um, equivalence is coming from. So we're so sorry. We're assuming it did by connect sum. Uh, then um, we would get this series of equivalences, which would mean that actually P of U would have to be equivalent to P star of U. That's what it means to be, for the connect sum to be equivalent to the unknot. But we showed uh, that the D invariants were not the same. So P of U was not equivalent to P star of U for these particular patterns. So, so they, this really does give exa an example that's different from connected sum. Um, okay, that's where I'm going to stop.